Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? <clears throat> Happy New Year to all of you. Hopefully your 2023 is off to a great start. Hey, super quick before we dive into this brand new series, I want to welcome all of our first-time guests at all of our different locations. If you're joining us at our Bandit campus, our Franklin campus, our Garfield Park campus, our Seymour campus, if you're watching online, if you're watching at one of our microsites here at Greenwood, we want to give you a very special welcome if this is your first time. Can we give it up for all of our first-time guests? It's a big, big deal for us to take some, for you to take some of your time and watch or be at one of our locations. Uh, we've prayed for you, planned for you, and prepared for you, so thank you for attending. And if you're not brand new, welcome back. It's great to see you in this brand new year. We are starting a brand new series today called Who's Counting? Now, this is the time of the year where a lot of people set up New Year's resolutions, set some goals for the new year. How many of you have actually done that? Raise your hand. You set some goals this year. Come on. Let's see those hands. The rest of you, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, this is a great time because to set goals because it's a fresh start. It's a clean slate. Like last year's over. Like this year's a blank slate. We can change things in our life. And so a lot of people set New Year's resolutions. A lot of people talk about, you know, quitting smoking or spending more time with their family or spending less money, saving more money. A lot of people talk about or set a New Year's resolution to lose the weight or to exercise more or to eat cleaner. How many of you set one of those goals in that area? Yeah, excellent. It's a great time of the year to do that. Now, no matter what, time, what kind of New Year's resolution you have set, what kind of goal you've set, what's true is that you are not going to make progress unless you are serious about counting. Have you noticed that? When you get serious about counting calories, you know you're going to make progress. When you get serious about counting your workouts, counting the minutes in your workout, counting the, the, the number of minutes of cardio that you're doing every single week, counting the number of words that you're writing if one of your New Year's resolutions is to write a book. <laughs> Last night I wrote 1,300 words. Amen. Praise Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to write a book this year, but I did write 1,300 words last night. But I was counting the words, right? When you start counting, things really start to change in your life. Why? Because counting gives us feedback. That's why. Counting lets us know the score. That's why we count. What's the score? Count it up. Counting lets us know what's in the bank account. Counting lets us know what's on the scale, like how much weight we got to lose. Like counting matters because counting lets us know if we're making progress or if we're not making progress. Some of you are like, yeah, that's exactly why I don't count. <laughs> I talked to a pastor one time. I was coaching him and I was like, okay, we're going to talk about how to grow your church. What has your attendance been on Sunday morning for the last year? You know what he said to me? I don't know. I was like, you don't know. Why aren't you counting? He said, I don't want to know. <laughs> Counting tells us what the score is. The, the, have you heard somebody say this? The numbers don't lie. Yes, yes. And so counting is important. In that when, the, when the church got off the ground in the book of Acts, when it first started, Peter preached this incredible sermon. I wish I could have heard it. The Holy Spirit came down from heaven. People's hearts opened up. And many, many people gave their lives to Jesus. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about, say it with me, 3,000 people in one day. That is church growth, if I've ever heard of it. <laughs> I mean, how did they know that 3,000 people were added? They counted them. 
One time Jesus, uh, uh, John was, uh, I'm sorry, Peter <laughs> was fishing in the, in, the last, uh, in the last part of the gospel of John and Jesus is on the shore. Peter drops his nets in the, into the water and he fishes all night, doesn't catch anything. Jesus says from the shore, hey, put your nets on the other side of the boat. And so they do it and then all of a sudden the, the nets fill up and there's so many fish in the, in the nets they can't even bring the fish on the boat. And so someone notices that Jesus was the one who said it. And so Peter jumps into the water. They were about 100 yards out. He swims to land and he discovers that it's Jesus. And he leaves his other, uh, his other workers, his, his brothers there his, to, to bring the boat in. And when they finally bring the boat in close to the shore, watch what Peter does. Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. How did they know there was 153? I mean, was it like, you know, was it like Rain Man or something like that? <laughs> like, how did they know? I mean, who would take the time to count? It's just a big pile of fish. Why did they count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Why didn't they say there was a pile, a real pile? Here's why. Because numbers matter. And when you count things, it reveals the power of God. It gives you a picture of where you are. It lets you know what your progress is. Counting is a good thing. Make sense? On the other hand, sometimes counting can be very wrong. In fact, if you're taking notes today on the digital app there, write this down. Sometimes counting can be sinful. You say, what? I thought you just said counting was good. We should count, count this, count that. They counted things in the Bible. Yeah, they did. Sometimes counting can be sinful. There's this incredible story captured in the book of First Chronicles about King David. I want you to hear how it starts. Listen to this. <clears throat> Satan, that's, not, that's an interesting way for a chapter to start. Satan rose up against Israel and caused David, this is King David of ancient Israel, to take a census of the people of Israel. So David said to Joab, his commander, the commander of his army, hey, Joab, take a census of all the people from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so that I may know how many people are there. What does Satan do? What does Satan do to you? What does Satan do to me? What does Satan do to this world? He tempts us. So in some way, shape, or form, Satan is tempting King David to count which means this is some sort of trap, which means counting the people is some sort of sin. It's some sort of evil. It's some sort of wrong doing. Listen to what Joab says back. May the Lord increase the number of his people a hundred times over, but why, King David? Why, my Lord the King? Do you want to do this? He continues, are they not all your servants? Why must you cause Israel to, say with me, Sin. Sometimes counting is a sin. That's interesting. Why would it be a sin? Well, you got to kind of know the history of what's going on in this situation. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, God laid out the parameters for a census to be taken. And by the way, a census is just counting the people, right? And the census had to be, first of all, it had to be God's idea. Second of all, there had to be a ransom payment for every single person that was counted. David breaks both of those rules. He says, I want to take a census. What we also discover as we look into this story is that Israel is coming off this massive victory against the Philistines. And right after this victory, King David calls for a census. Now, why did kings back in that time call for a census? Two reasons. Number one, to build up their military and to levy taxes which are not things, not bad things in and of themselves. Unless you're God's chosen king, unless you're supposed to rule the kingdom under God's authority and trust in God, unlike the secular kings of David's time who would take a census to build up their military and levy taxes to become more and more powerful. Evidently, David, coming off this massive victory, decides to forego serving or submitting to God, take matters into his own hand, and become a more and more powerful leader by building his military and raising more money. See, the reason why David's counting was sinful, if you're taking notes again on the digital app, David's counting was motivated by self-reliance and pride. It wasn't a sin to count the people. That's not, that's not the sinful action. It was the motivation behind the counting. You understand what I'm saying? Yes or no? Motivation matters. 
Last time I checked, this book tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James chapter four, verse six. So here's King David acting in pride and arrogance and self-reliance. Count the people, build the military, levy taxes. Let's conquer more and more people. And God decides to put a stop to it and punishes Israel. And 70,000 people die by a plague as a result of David's counting. Do you think we need to be careful when we're counting? Yes or no? What matters when it comes to counting is motivation. If you're counting certain things so that you can draw attention to yourself, watch out. If you're counting likes or comments on your Facebook posts or Instagram posts so that you can be somebody, an influencer, so people will notice you and look up to you and worship you, watch out. If you're counting what you've accumulated, whether it be material possessions or cars or whatever it is, so that other people will admire you and envy you, watch out. If you're counting your calories and counting how much you can bench press and counting your golf strokes so that other people will envy you or respect you or look up to you or whatever, watch out. It's not the counting that's sinful. It's the motivation behind the counting that makes it righteous or unrighteous. Make sense? How do we make sure that our counting is in alignment with God's will? Because we have to count. Counting reveals progress. Counting lets us know we're on track. Counting reveals the glory of God. Well, here's how we make sure that our counting is aligned with God's will. Our counting is aligned with God when our counting tracks the progress that God has designed us to make. See, this is all about God. Let me give you an example. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine or any alcohol, because it'll ruin your life. You can look it up, Ephesians 5.18. Okay, so we know clearly that it is God's will for us to not be intoxicated with alcohol. That doesn't mean you can't have a drink. It just means you can't get drunk. That, becomes, that crosses a line. It becomes sinful, okay? Now, what happens when you have a problem with alcohol and you consistently get drunk, but it's New Year's resolution time and it's goal setting time and you want to start over, clean slate, we're going to go and let's give it a shot. Let's give sobriety a shot. Now you start counting. Is it God's will for you to be sober? Yes or no? Yes. So now your counting becomes motivated by something God wants you to do. And so you count. Day one, did you know that in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, those of you who are involved in that, and I, I recommend those things, we even have a version of that here at the church, um, it's called uh, Celebrate Recovery, that you can get a 21-day, a 24-hour coin, 24-hour coin. You go 24 hours without using drugs or alcohol, you get a coin in your pocket, and that's very exciting. There's also a 30-day coin. There's also a 90-day coin. There's also a six-month coin. There's a one-year coin. There's a two-year coin. There's a 10-year coin. These are real coins that you get when you reach a certain number. You want to know what coin is celebrated the most? It's the 30-day coin. You just ask around. Because the 30-day coin is a big deal because it shows that you have now passed the 21 days, which is what it takes to you know, start a new direction in your life or a new habit, which by the way, that's why we're doing the 21 day fast. If you heard about it, it starts tomorrow. If you haven't heard about it, you should learn about it right here at this website right here, 21dayfast.org forward slash something, something, something website, right? Right there. <laughs> so get on that website and read more about it. Why do we do that? Every single year we do that. Why? Because when you do something over and over and over, it sets a new, a new course for your life. It changes direction. It wakes you up, right? So the 30-day coin is a big deal. Now, the 90-day coin is a big deal as well. But you get 30 days under your belt, people celebrate. Like, oh, I got 30 days. This is a big deal. New direction for your life. Sobriety. And on and on and on. So when you're counting something, that is, a, that is on track with what God wants for your life, that counting becomes righteous. How many days have you gone without pornography? How many days have you gone with a certain workout routine? Because you know that it's God's will for you to be a good steward of your body, which, by the way, we're going to talk about health and fitness next week, right? Are you going to come back? Anybody? He's like, I ain't coming back for that one. <laughs> But we got to talk about that, right? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you're a steward of that body. So it's good to count certain things in order to get that body into shape. 
Your county becomes righteous when it's in alignment with what God wants for your life. Why does counting really work? Let's get, let's get deeper on this. Counting works because it creates repetition. Counting works because it creates ritual. Counting works because it creates habits. One person said it like this. We first make our habits, and then our habits make us. It creates repetitious behavior in our lives. Aristotle said it like this. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act. It's not something that we do every once in a while. It is a habit. Counting works in our life because counting creates this thing called consistency. And as I coach people and work with people and counsel people and help people, here's what I see. A massive lack of consistency. People are good for a few days. They'll do it five times and then they fall off. And they stop doing it. Oh, I was on track, but then this happened. Well, then I was doing well, but then that happened. And I lost my job. And this person got sick. And, oh, yeah. and all of a sudden, we fall off the wagon. We lack consistency. But counting creates habit. And habit is all about consistency. If you can get this into your mind and heart, it'll change your life. I, I, really, I really believe this. It's not what you do every now and then that changes your life. It's what you do every day that changes your life which is why I read the Bible every day, every day. It doesn't make me super spiritual. It's just something I do every day. It started actually uh, 150 days before I married Jackie. Now, I married Jackie 23 years ago. It's a long time ago. Still love you. <laughs> and 150 days before I married Jackie, on August 14, 1999, I started reading a psalm a day because there's 150 psalms. And so I read 150 days out, I read Psalm 150. 149 days out, I read 149. 148 days out, I read 148. You get the point. I read every single day, the whole book of Psalms, counting down to my wedding day. And since then, I've just read the Bible every day. Because it's not what you do every now and then that matters. It's what you do every day that matters. One of my New Year's resolutions this year is to memorize one Bible verse a day every single day of 2023. That's 365 Bible verses this year. This morning's verse was Matthew 6, verse 33. It says, seek first the kingdom of God above all else, and then I'll give you everything that you need. I kind of cheated on that one because I already had that one memorized, but I figured I'd give myself a break because I was preaching this morning. So, But nonetheless, I went over it and reviewed it. If you can get that into your mind and heart, that consistency is the way that you change your life. And counting is a means of creating that consistency. You with me? Now, hopefully at this point, everyone watching at all of our campuses, watching online, microsites here at Greenwood, you're like, okay, you convinced me. Tell me what to count. <laughs> Are you there? Are you on the edge of your seat ready to take notes? Because that's what I imagine in my mind. <laughs> What should you count? And really, when we ask that question, we're really asking this question, what is important? That's what we're really asking. In this series, I want to talk about four things that I think are massively important for you. Your attitude, that's what we're going to talk about today. Hello. I want to talk about your relationships. I want to talk about your health and fitness. And I want to talk about something else <laughs> that's really important. <laughs> But I'll get to that later. But right now, I want to talk about your attitude. I want to talk about your attitude. We had somebody walk in this morning and at the 9 o'clock service and find out we no longer have printed out notes. And they're like, that's it. I'm leaving the church. Attitude. How's yours today? Why would I take some time to talk about your attitude today and try to count some things to improve it? Here's why. Because your attitude is one of the most important aspects of your life. I love the way Zig Ziglar explained it. He said, your attitude determines your altitude. Wow. In other words, your attitude about life determines how far you'll go in life. Some are like, no, it's all about who you know and who you're connected and your parents have money. No, no, no. Your attitude determines how far you go in this life. Why talk about attitude? Listen to what Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says. Paul said, you must have the same, say it with me, attitude as Jesus Christ. 
wow, how far away are you from that? How far away am I from that? We got some work to do. Why is attitude so important? Because when you have a stinky attitude, people don't like you. They really don't. They don't. There's a bunch of people that don't like you because your attitude stinks. <laughs> I was in the sauna the other day. I like to go in the sauna after my workout, <clears throat> and we're sitting there, and it's packed. Oh, man, it's just wall to wall. Guys are standing there, and it wasn't very hot, so I thought it would be good to put some water on the machine there, the little unit which there's a sign on the wall that says, do not pour water. <laughs> but I'm a New Yorker, so it's like, pff, rules. <laughs> so I pour some water on there, and it gets it nice and hot right away. And this dude in the corner, like, he just goes off. He's like, what the? Can't you read the sign? You know how to follow rules? And I was like, whoa, whoa, you know. This whole room is packed full of dudes. I got to calm down, you know? I was like, okay, you know? Well, my buddy was sitting on my right. He did not like the way this guy was talking to me. So he pipes up and says, hey, bud, you don't got to be disrespectful, you know? So then he jumps on him and says, well, well you can't read the sign either? I was like, blah, blah, blah. And they start going at it. I'm like, oh, I, I raised my hand and said, hey, 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 hey. I poured the water and I am sorry. And I apologize. I won't do that anymore. It's Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and I you know, tried to bring some peace and calm, calm some attitudes down. Calm some, you get a bunch of dudes in a 180 degree room, degree room and it is, it's not hard to start a fight. Anyway, so then, not joking, five seconds later, this other dude walks in who all of us love. His name's Henry. He's so happy and joyful. He bounces around all the time. He's just fist pumping everybody. And he, and one thing about Henry is he loves to pour stuff on the, on the machine too. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, when he walks in, I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Cause I'm not saying anything. I'm just staying. He doesn't just like to pour stuff on there. He puts the eucalyptus oil on there, which makes the whole thing smell and go into your eyes and all that stuff. And, and I'm like, this is going to be real good because this guy's hot. <laughs> so sure enough, Henry grabs his stuff. He's ch -ch 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 all of a sudden, well, this dude loses it. What the? And he just jumps up and he starts cussing at Henry. And, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I know I'm a pastor, but I am going to jump on this guy's neck if he throws a punch at Henry because this is my man. Henry's my man. <laughs> and everybody else in the sauna was thinking the same thing, you know? I go, what's wrong with this dude, you know? So they're, they're going nose to nose and they're about to fight and Henry's kind of like being all calm and chill, but this dude's so mad. Amazingly, no punches are thrown and he just walks out of the sauna. And when he walked out, I thought, and then we kind of talked to him amongst us, like, man, what's wrong with that guy? Nobody likes him. And there's no way that he left that sauna to some other group of people that were like, hey, bud, what's going on? <laughs> because here's the truth, here's the truth. Nobody likes people like that. Attitude determines altitude, 100%. And so we've got to work on our attitudes if we want to move forward in our life. You know, the Bible talks about this in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. It says, a cheerful heart is, say it with me, it's good medicine. This is the Bible's way of saying a positive attitude heals when you have a positive, joyful heart, it brings some, some healing power to a situation, whatever situation you find yourself in, with a difficult marriage or a difficult financial situation, because life is hard, is it not? There's sickness, there's death, there's tragedy, there's job loss, there's all these different things that happen to us. Well, we can either bring some healing medicine to those situations, or we can actually make them worse. Look what it says, a broken spirit saps a person's strength. You can, you can make an already difficult situation even worse by bringing a negative attitude into the equation. And so many of us do that and things spiral and spiral out of control and things lead into fights and division and divorces and on and on and on. In, in your digital notes, I'd love for you to put this in there. Your inner condition creates your outer experience. People don't believe that today. They really don't. They believe that their inner condition is a result of their outer circumstances and that their bad attitude is justified because they got fired. Their bad attitude is justified because someone betrayed them. Their bad attitude is justified because someone poured water on the furnace, which I did, and that wasn't right, and I do need to own some of that, and I am sorry if you're watching today, bad attitude guy. 
Hey, we live in a small community. You never know. <laughs> but our inner condition is our choice. It's not a result of the outward circumstances. We get to choose how we feel. We are not victims. And so hopefully at this point in the message, you're like, okay, okay, you convinced me. Your attitude is important. What should I count? How, how do I make myself, my attitude better? Well, that is a great question. I want to give you four ideas, four specific things that you can count to improve your attitude. The first one is this. Count how many times you can practice gratitude. Oh, so important. Did you know that the science is in on this? Like people have done studies and research on this. The connection between gratitude and joy, the connection between thankfulness and happiness. There is a Harvard, uh, Harvard uh, medical school document that came out, article, whatever you want to call it, uh, recently. It was called How, Why, Gratitude leads to more happiness. And in the article, it talked about how this one scientist put three groups of people together. The first group of people was, uh, was supposed to write down uh, for 10 weeks a couple of things they were, they were thankful for. The second group of people wrote down a couple of things that really aggravated them every day. And the third group of people just wrote down the events of the day. And then after 10 weeks, they, they kind of did some research on, the, on those, these three groups. They found that the first group was 25% happier than everybody else. They went to the doctor less often, and they even exercised more, all from practicing gratitude. No wonder the Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you, for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Did you know there's only three places in the Bible where it directly says, this is God's will for your life? One is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which says it's God's will for you to be sexually pure. Another is in John chapter 13, where it says it's God's will that you should be a servant. And here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that we should be thankful. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to ask anybody about it. Just be thankful in all circumstances. Why? Because it brings joy to your life. So you might be thinking, well, what am I supposed to count? Well, let me give you a few things. Count these. Thank you notes. It's a simple way to express gratitude. I, I made a, a New Year's resolution this year to write one thank you note every single day, 365 thank you notes, just to express more gratitude. So if you have received one from me in the last six days, it's because I have set a goal. I want to express more gratitude because this church would not be where it is today without you guys. So thank you. I want to express more gratitude because I want to experience more joy. Number two, another one is to end, make entries into a gratitude journal. Every single day, just write down two or three things that you are thankful for. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 2, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that he has done for me. How can we set ourselves up to never forget what God has done for us? Write them down. Write down the things that God is doing in your life. You will Im immediately sense joy in your life because gratitude increases happiness up to 25%. Number two, what else can we do? We can count the ways or count the times that we interpret events in a positive way. I cannot tell you how important this one is, for me personally, because lots of things happen, events happen, negative things happen, people do this, people do that, it's hard, life is difficult. If I don't interpret events positively, my attitude's gonna be in the toilet. How about you? What do I mean by interpreting things in a positive way? Well, if you think about it, events happen to us. Things take place. Cars get nails in their tires. I have a nail in my tire right now. Just right outside. Just, just, just it happens. In fact, it's the third time. I have no idea why. Just nail on tire. That sucks. Things happen, right? People do things. They don't follow through on what they say. They, people get sick. There are accidents. Like... So there's events, right? All these things. What, what people naturally do without even thinking is attribute a negativity to that event. Did you know that you don't have to do that? That no one's holding you hostage to attach negative meaning to any event in your life? Did you know that you can actually attach positive meaning to any event in your life? Whether it's a nail in the tire or someone cussing you out in the sauna. You say, where does it say that in the Bible? Good question. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy. It's interesting. Not just joy, 
pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Now, this word trial is the Greek word flipsis. It means pain, hardship, difficulty. Why? How can I consider it joy when I go through pain? Because you know that the testing of your, watch this, your faith produces this thing called perseverance. Now, what is perseverance? Perseverance is the ability to keep on going when things are hard. Do you need some of that? Are you a college student trying to get through college? Are you a high school student trying to get through high school? Are you a parent trying to parent kids that are young? Right? Are you a business owner trying to get a business up off the ground? What, what are you? You need some perseverance, yes or no? Yeah. But James doesn't stop there. Let per- perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete in need or lacking nothing. In other words, here's what God does. God God brings us to this place of maturity or completion. Think of a baby that's in its mother's womb for nine months. The the, the bun is ready to get that thing out of the oven, right? Can't stay in there any longer. It's done. It's complete, right? That's what God wants to do in you. He wants to mature you and complete you. And how does he do that? He puts you through the fire. He puts you through a test of your faith. You say, I don't like that. Neither do I. Why doesn't God do it in a different way? I don't know. Maybe when you die, you can ask him. But what we do know is that if we're alive, he's going to take us through trials to produce this thing called perseverance so that we can become mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, that is a fact, whether you like it or not. So what happens is now I can look at a difficult circumstance and I can attach positive meaning because I know that God is using this situation to produce perseverance in me. Is this making sense? Yes or no? I'm doing my best. So you say, well, what do I count then? Well, how about you count this? How many times can you say, this is happening for my growth? How many times? Five times a day? Six times a day? Hey, some of you need to say it 10 times a day because your attitude stinks. (laughs) You need to say, every time something happens that you don't like, this is happening for my growth. And if you don't like that statement, you can try on a different statement. I can grow from this. It's a little bit nicer. (laughs) I can grow from this. In fact, I think we can all say that together. Want to try it? You want to say it together? One, two, three. I can grow from this. Let's do it again. All of our campuses. I can grow from this. What if you said that 10 times a day? Here's what I think would happen. Your attitude would suddenly rise. Why? Because you could see the positive and the negative. Yes? This is perhaps the most important point I'm going to share with you today. So number one, show gratitude. Number two, interpret events positively. Number three, Think about how or count the times you can help someone else. Here's what I'm saying to you. Get your mind off of yourself. (laughs) Stop taking selfies. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop talking about yourself. Stop being selfish. Get your mind on other people. Listen, this is incredible. I think about this all the time. There are seven and a half billion of us out there now. Little, Little creepy human beings all over the planet. We are. We're creepy. We are. We are. We're just creepy. We do creepy things. I do them too. You do them. That's fine. You're weird and you're creepy. You glad you came to church today? There's seven and a half billion of us, like ants. We're like, we're like ants crawling all over the planet. How in the world could you ever think that this life is about you, that somehow you are the main character? How could you ever? It, the, the, sheer, the sheer numbers of humans on the planet is a metaphor to teach you how small we are. We're tiny. We're nobodies on this planet, which should tell us that maybe life is about helping you. Maybe it's about helping you. Maybe it's about helping my spouse. Maybe the idea about life is you wake up every day. So how can I serve humanity? There's so many of them. So many need help. Wow. Do you know the science is in on this too? Like people have done the research. When you decide to give time, energy, money to other people, you return The return on your investment is joy. The happy hormones start flooding your system like dopamine, you know, that that, that thing you get when you eat sugar or you drink alcohol. (laughs) You can get that through giving to other people. It's amazing. Listen to what uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 6 verse 2. Carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, wake up in the morning and instead of just thinking about your own burdens, think about the burden of your spouse, the burden of your kids, the burden of someone. What do they have going on and how can I carry them? And in return, you are blessed with joy, which is why Jesus said these words. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. 
So think, count. What are you, so what am I going to count? I'm going to count three specific things here. Ready? Number one, an encouraging word or a listening ear. You can do that. doesn't cost you anything. A little time. That's all. Second one, financial help. If you got some extra money, which we're supposed to have, the Bible tells us to work with our hands that we might have some to give to others, right? Take care of our own needs and give to others. Maybe you have a lot, so give a lot. Help somebody adopt a child. I don't know. Maybe you have a little. Help somebody get a Starbucks through a drive-thru. I don't know. But give some of your money away. Help someone else financially. And then count how many times you can just give some time. Maybe you can babysit for somebody. Maybe you can jump in and help them fix a tire. I don't know. I need my tire fixed. <laughs> no, you don't have to help me. Seriously, I'm going to take it to the dealership. It's fine. But, <laughs> but you know what? I did have a friend who I told him I had that nail on the tire. You know what he did? Nine o'clock at night. Place was closed. I was going to get a flat the next day. You know what he did? Left his house, drove to my house 20 minutes away, gave me his generator, his portable generator, so that my tire wouldn't be flat in the morning. You know, I woke up. It was pretty flat. I had to refill it. I've been refilling it every day for the last two days now. <laughs> and then he drove 20 minutes home. Yeah, I wonder if I would ask him today. I don't know where he is. How did it make him feel? Because he blessed me. I wonder if he was blessed. I wonder if his wife was blessed. I would imagine that they were. Give help. Give time. Think about other people. Let me give you this last one. Okay, number four. Maybe my favorite one. I know I said that about number two, but this is a good one too. How do you increase your attitude? Make it better. Count how many times you can engage in God's word. Oh, so critical. God's word is a source of joy. If you can look at it that way, it'll change your life. When I was a student at Liberty University many, many, many years ago, I came across this passage in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, changed my life. When I discovered your words, I devoured them. I ate them. I took them into my soul. They, your words, are the joy and my heart's delight. Another version says, they are the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. When I read that when I was a young, stu young student at Liberty, I was in my 20s. I was like, okay, that's it. This is, this is my book. This is my book. I'm going to read a lot of other books. I do read a lot of other books. Many of you know that. But this is my book. This is my joy. It's the delight of my heart. And I've been doing it for a long, long time. So when you see me out and I'm smiling, talking with people, or, you know, I seem to have a, a, a positive attitude here or there, you know, some people think I'm, I'm a fake. That's fine. I don't care. I really don't. Because a lot of people think a lot of things. <laughs> But I know what's true in my heart. What's true in my heart is I'm actually happy. I really am. I really am. I read the Bible this morning. I was encouraged to seek the kingdom of God above all else and to, to live righteously, and God's going to take care of all my needs. I was encouraged. Genuinely encouraged. By what? By, by this book. I devour these words. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Like, just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean, oh, well, that's your job. You're supposed to read the Bible. No, you can read it. Meditate on it, study it, devour it, take it into your soul so that it brings joy to your heart. So if you were to do that, what would you count? Let me give you two ideas. Days completed in a reading plan. This is so easy right now. All you have to do is get on the YouVersion Bible app. It's so easy. You download it. Right now, I'm counting my streak. I've got 161 days there, 22 weeks in a row without missing a day. I'm so bummed out because something happened in 2023. I can't remember what happened. I couldn't get to my phone, and I broke my streak. Arr! Started over, 161 days. I'm going to keep it all the way through to see how long I can go. Why? Because counting creates consistency. Consistency creates habits. We first make our habits, then our habits make us. Make sense? So get the YouVersion Bible app or get the re some sort of reading plan and get in the habit of counting how many days in a row you can do that. Something else you can do is verses memorized in a week. So I already told you my goal is to do 365 verses this year. You can come up and just do something like, hey, I'm going to do two verses a week. I'm going to do one verse a week. I'm going to do five verses a week. Something to get the word of God into your heart, into your mind. Does this make sense? Here's why I'm so encouraged about this. I work really hard on my attitude. I really do. So it's not always the best, okay? But I really try to have a positive attitude because attitude determines altitude. It really, really does. If you were to decide that you were gonna start to express gratitude and count how many times you can express gratitude, if you were gonna count how many times you can interpret events in a positive way, if you started counting how many times you actually help someone or bless someone and counted how many times you engage in God's word, check this out. You could potentially, if expressing gratitude increases your attitude by 25%, 25%, 
you could potentially increase your attitude by another 10% by interpreting events positively, another 10% by helping other people, and another 10% by getting in the word. You could potentially increase your attitude or make your attitude better by 55%. I'm not good at math, but was I right? Wow. Some of you need to improve your attitude by 10%. Some of you need to improve your attitude by 50%. I've given you the tools to do that today. Let me give you a quick challenge, ready? As you walk out of here today. I want you to grade your attitude. Be serious, be honest, where are you at? If 10 is the same attitude as Jesus Christ, positive, all things work together for the good of those who love God, you know, count it all joy when trials come and nothing gets you down and you're a, awesome. Then grade yourself a 10. If you're a one, if you're the sauna dude, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Again, if you're watching, I, I, it was my fault. But if you're like a one and, and, and you get upset when someone sprinkles water on a, hey, then just be honest. Give yourself a one. You got some work to do. If you're a five, give yourself a five. If you're a five, don't give yourself an eight. Come on. Some of you are not going to do this. Why did you come today? This is where the rubber meets the road. Grade yourself and then identify, okay, which one of those four things do I need to do? What do I need to start counting to make my attitude better? Here's why, because attitude determines altitude. Yes? Make sense? Now, today is Communion Sunday. So we're gonna transition into that section of the service. But before I do that, I just wanna pray for us that we would absorb these words and that we would take action before we move into a time of reflection and remembrance that we call communion. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you tell us that a cheerful heart is like good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. You've made it so clear that our attitude affects our whole life. It affects our relationships. It affects how people perceive us, how they experience us. It affects how far we go in life. God, you've revealed to us that our inner condition creates our outer experience. Help us to own that idea, that truth, that our attitude is our responsibility. Help us to stop blaming our poor attitude on the circumstances and what other people are doing or saying or not doing or not saying. It's our responsibility. Help us to own that. Help us to take action. To be gratitude, to be gratitude, to show gratitude. God, to interpret events positively. To engage your word. To serve other people. Help us to improve our attitude so that we can have the same attitude as your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, as we transition into this next few moments of our service, which is all about communion, I want to reference a verse I talked about a few moments ago in Psalm 103, verse 2. It says, let all that I am praise the Lord. Let me not forget all of the things that he has done for me. Another version says, let me not forget all of his benefits. We tend to forget, don't we? In fact, we tend to forget the most important blessing God has ever given us, which is his son, Jesus Christ. We do. We forget that Jesus died a bloody, brutal death on the cross so that we can experience the forgiveness of sins, so that we can experience eternal life and fellowship with God. We forget. We do. We get busy. We go get going with life. And Jesus is the last thing on our our mind. And what he did for us is the last thing on our mind. And so you know what God did? It's It's so clever. It's so good so wise. He gave us this thing called communion, eating a little bit of bread and drinking a little bit of juice. And the reason why he gave it to us is so that we would remember, go back to the cross and what Christ did for us. The juice is is to represent the spilled blood of Christ. You know, Jesus, he bled. It poured out of his head and his, his, his shoulders and his back and his hands and his feet. He bled for you. 
And this bread, it represents his body that was broken. He was beaten time and time again with a stick and over his head and he's punched in the face and they pulled his beard out. And, and, and we forget about that. Like that was the cost of redemption. That's what it cost us to be forgiven. Like grace is free, but it wasn't cheap. And so Jesus gives us this thing called communion to remember him, to remember the cost, remember the price. And so this moment, these next few moments, they're actually designed for people who are believers. So for, for people who have trusted in Christ, for disciples of Jesus. So if you're not a disciple, if you're not a follower yet, our hope is that you'll become one, you can sit this part of the service out, just observe. But if you are a believer, this is a moment for you to recommit, to remember, to rekindle your love for what Christ has done for you. So I'm gonna lead us through here, eating this bread and drinking this juice. And as we do that, we're gonna sing a song right after this. As we do that, I just want you to take a few moments and reflect and remember the grace, the moment you placed your faith in Christ, the moment you put your trust in him, the moment that you realized he died for you. Like he paid for your sin. Whatever you need to say to him, say it to him. However you need to recommit, recommit to him as we receive communion today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, Paul was instructing the Corinthians on how Jesus did this. He said, the night before he was betrayed, Jesus took some bread. It's probably a loaf of bread. We have a little wafer here today to represent it, but he took the bread and Jesus broke the bread and he gave a piece out to his disciples. And he said to them, he said, this bread represents my body. I want you to eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, Paul instructed the Corinthians, he said, Jesus grabbed the cup, a cup of wine, and he passed some out to his disciples. And he said to them, this cup, the juice in this cup represents my blood, the new covenant between God and man. There's now forgiveness of sins available because I spilled my blood. I want you to drink this in remembrance of me. All of our campuses, will you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious gift of your Son, Jesus. He was everything we needed and more. He is redemption. He is forgiveness. He is grace. Jesus, we give you glory today as we remember your sacrifice on the cross. You gave your life. You allowed yourself to be broken, humiliated, mocked, beaten, condemned, and killed so that we could be forgiven. We thank you for that sacrifice today. And we remember the cost, the price that you paid. We worship you for that. As we sing this song and then just remind ourselves of the many, many miracles that you have blessed us with and performed, may you be pleased and may it bring a smile to your face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And so doing so, you fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, what is that? Well, if you were here a couple weeks ago for our series on carols, we talked about the last carol, the last carol was uh, Oh Holy Night. And one of the lyrics in that song was, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. The law of Christ is love. So really to carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ is another way of saying, love your neighbor as I have loved you. How has Christ loved us? He carried our burden for us, our biggest burden. And our biggest burden was sin. We've all sinned. 
Christ carried that burden all the way to the cross. And as I just explained during communion, he shed his blood and had his body broken so that that burden that you and I carry could be washed away and forgiven. It could be taken off your shoulders. Many of you have already experienced that, but some of you haven't. If you've never had Christ take the burden of sin off your life, maybe today is your day. Maybe this is your moment. I'm not talking about joining a church or becoming religious or joining a religion. I'm talking about asking Christ to be your savior and to forgive your sins and to come into your heart and forgive you. If that's what you would like to do today and something has clicked in your mind and you finally got it, take these words in a prayer I'm about to pray, talk to God, do business with him as if you and him are the only ones in the room. Will you pray with me if you feel led to? Just say this to him, dear Jesus, I believe I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, carried my burden, shed your blood, allowed your body to be broken so that I could be forgiven. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me of my sin, wash me clean. Give me a brand new heart and come dwell within me as I reach out to you in faith. I believe you died for me and you rose again to be my savior. So from this day forward, teach me to follow you and honor you and love you, cherish you and surrender to you and obey you pray this in Jesus name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, our church would like to celebrate with you. Would we not church? Amen. Whether you're here at Greenwood or if you're watching online, we put a little package together for you. It's sort of a starter kit. We call it our save box. Inside this box, there's a Bible. That's the number one important thing. Uh, We talked about that today with a reading plan in here. So if you put your faith in Christ today, text the word SAVE to 65248 and grab one of these at the information desk. There's also some information in here about baptism, small groups, impact team, and there's a little gift in here from us to you to say congratulations. So if you you trusted Christ today, text that word SAVE to 65248. We'll get one of those to you in your hands. One more time, church. Can we give God glory? Amen. Attitude determines altitude. So here's your first test, ready? The parking lot, okay? So I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray, and then we'll dismiss uh, to the local teams. Lord, we love you. Thanks for a great day today, great opportunity to get, a, get 2023 started off on the right foot. Help us to improve our attitudes today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Right now, I'm gonna hand things off to the local team. See you next week. Well, thank you, Pastor Danny, and thank you for everyone watching online with us today. What a blessed time of communion, and what an incredible kickoff to our Who's Counting series. If you made the decision to follow Jesus, congrats to you. Make sure you text SAVE to 65248 so that we can send you a SAVE box in the mail. And I'd love to follow up with you personally this week to help guide you on your new spiritual journey. Also, we have a fun online campus Facebook group page that we would love for you to join. Click the link in the chat. And we'd love to engage with you on your 21-day fast that kicks off tomorrow. Up next is our online children's ministry experience. You guys have an incredible week. We'll see you next week and bring a friend.